Well, I'm delighted to say that uh, joining me on the Godcast today is a gentleman who le needs little introduction, but I'm going to do one anyway. It's uh, Chris Difford from Squeeze. Chris, how are you? I'm pretty good, thank you. Lovely to see you, Alex. And you as well. And and you're you're not in the UK. You're you're um, across the pond at the moment. Is that correct? Yes. Today we're in um, Detroit. Um, on the outskirts of Detroit. Um, so we're doing a show tonight with supporting Hall and & Oates. And, and you've been doing that a, a little while, you've been back on the road a, 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 a few weeks now? Yeah, we've been on, on back on the road for a few weeks and it's very different from touring in the past. The, um, the whole COVID protocol has completely sort of um, change the way that we have to work so we have to be in a very tight bubble we can't meet with people um we have to get tested every day it's it's yeah it's different it's very different yeah have you uh, noticed a yearning uh, from the audiences for live performances i was um, fortunate to go to uh, tramlines festival just a few weeks ago in in sheffield and the atmosphere was quite incredible, something I've not really experienced before. How's it, how's it been in, in America? Uh, yeah, the first night we played in Nashville and uh, we got a standing ovation before we struck a note and that was very moving. Um, and then the other night we were supporting Hall of Notes, I can't remember where, and uh, I came over very emotional. I have to say the audience felt I suppose, really encouraged to be out again and listening to live music. Yeah. And, and is that, that reciprocated, Chris, in as much as you were desperate to be out there? That, that was the feeling I got at the festival, is the bands have just kind of been uh, chewing their fingernails for far too long and just desperate to get back in front of a live audience. Is, was that the case for yourself? Um, well, I haven't been chewing fingernails waiting to get back out to play live, but um, I, I've... I've missed aspects of touring. Touring is a, is a is an odd animal, really, because most of the day you're sitting in a hotel room or traveling, and the the glory moments, which are the fifty minutes that you're on stage, whiz by. Yeah, and and um, and touring is it is it one of those things where um, is it an enjoyment? You know, I mean, uh, my, I think about my favourite band, Chris, who are Depeche Mode, who go on these humongous world tours for, you know, almost 18 months, two years, um, and then you don't see them for three or four years. Is it, is it, is it a pleasure or, or is it a struggle? Depends. It varies for me from day to day. I mean, I enjoy touring, but, it, you know, emotionally... You can be, you know, like anybody doing any job, whether you're working in an insurance company or a bank or driving a bus or or being in a band, you have your up and down days. And particularly being away from home, there are elements of that that I miss. Um, and so you get by it and it's surprising how quickly the tour is is done, really. Yeah. And you've got you've got these dates in America, and then and then I was looking. You're you're heading back, and then you're working with uh, another fabulous band, Madness, in the winter. Yeah, we support Madness for some shows, um, which will be fun. Uh, again, it will be a short set for us, um, but we're hoping that you know by doing these kind of shows that it will open our audience up a little bit wider for the coming years. Yeah. With with uh, with madness, Chris, they're a, they're a band that I kind of was, uh, kind of grew up with, and uh, I went to see Suggs in his one man show. I don't know if you've uh, you've observed it. Um, I've seen it many times. Uh, and um, and one of, one of the things that struck me, Chris, is that uh, when Suggs talked about his career uh, and madness, it was all a bit kind of lucky and by chance. I was wondering how that was for you with Squeeze. Was, was it? Was it a real intent and were you really driven uh, for a good career in music or, or was there an element of luck attached as well? I think there's luck attached to everything, to be honest. I think the day 
when you sort of fall into being in a band when you're a young kid there's there's obviously tons of luck involved in who you play with what your shows are going to be like um you know that it, 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 you you kind of in a way you stumble from one piece of luck to another possibly yeah where where where, where do you feel there was a lucky break for you and and the band if if, if that was the case um well i think the lucky break really was just meeting each other, you know, meeting Glenn, meeting Jules, meeting Gilson, you know, when you meet people for the first time and you form a band, it's quite an exciting journey. Yeah. And and what, um, you know, you, I guess you've been asked this question a lot, but what, what's your, uh, maybe ask it in a different way rather than just say, what, what music were you listening to? What, what kind of the, what were the kind of songs that you remember as a kid on the radio that, that made your ears prick up? Everything from Peters and Lee to the Grateful Dead. <laughs> and, and did you did you find um, a genre that you warmed to? I remember when I was a kid, I found myself warming to to bands like Madness and Depeche Mode, which I know they're they're quite different. But I was I, I was trying to think why that was. To this day, I don't know why. But did you find yourself elevated to a certain genre? Um, well, I kind of rumbled around between different people, between, you know, um, the Velvet Underground and the MC5 and bands that were quite sharp edged at that time for me anyway, to more sort of genteel music like Donovan and Bob Dylan and um, Johnny Mitchell, let's, let's say. So I, I, I think you know, when you're younger, you're like a, a sponge, you're, you're sort of eating up or you're soaking up all the different elements of different people's music, music, and that's what makes you who you are. Mm. Chris, I, you just mentioned Johnny Mitchell, and um, I've recently had Vinnie Corlita, uh, the drummer on on the Godcast, and I asked him the question about um, music, what, it, what, what was it that kind of has this ability to take people to, a, to a, some sort of spiritual place? He described it as kind of um, heavenly language, which I, which is a priest I found quite endearing. But I was wondering what your take on that is, that this ability that we can go and see a band and, and it takes us to places that we, we can't ordinarily get to in our nine to five lives. What's your <coughs> view on that? Um, I, I think music and songwriting can be a spiritual journey insofar as it 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 can represent part of your part of your life that nothing else can so you know you can listen to a temptation song and it takes you back to when you were first dating girls for instance so music has a way of i believe pinning you to a board of memories in some ways and some music is more spiritual than others, I think, because if it's very lyrical, you have to kind of dig deep and listen hard. And I don't think the spiritual part of your anatomy will allows you to sort of um, drift off but in kind of more relaxing kind of James Taylor, Joni Mitchell -y kind of music. Mm. You can you don't have to dive into the lyrics so deep deeply you can just sort of levitate above it all yeah yeah were you were you in um i don't know if this question has been asked before chris but were you influenced by church music at all or have you ever been influenced by church music uh you know you, you're a you're a wonderful lyricist and uh you know I, I think try and make connections with the bible you know something like the 23rd psalm which is to me, is a beautiful structured piece of writing. I was wondering if you'd got, had any influences by scripture. I actually haven't, but um, I wish I did. Um, you, you should send me a link to that psalm. I mean, I had a very re religious mother and father who both worked at the local church and when I was growing up, that's where we went every week. Um, and all of my mum's friends were from the church. 
It was a community of like-minded people who relied on each other to get through working class people. And um, it felt safe. Um, my mum was always in awe of the church and what it could provide for her. Um, I guess as a young boy growing up, I didn't really hang around um, to be part of the church because I was kind of, I needed to get away from all of the sort of spirituality and the religion that my parents had because it wasn't for me at that point. Mm -hmm. But now at the other end of the corridor in my life, I, I find myself finding it more interesting. When you say when you say that, Chris, do you mean uh, religion per se, or or uh, meditation, or yoga? What what is it that that you're particularly drawn to? Um, well, as a recovering addict, um, there is a spirituality around the journey that I have uh, have had, and um, on a daily basis, um, it's important to log in to. Um, the spiritual self because that, that's the person that's the energy that keeps me so sober um, and one of my best friends is a, a priest in the village where I live and um, you know he, he's taught me that it's not all about God you know that it's all about nature it's all about so many other things um, and he writes about it extremely well in his sermons, which he emails. And um, it's like poet, poetry, and it does all tie in with the Bible, Bible eventually, which is such a brilliant book. Um, so um, I, I think everybody is connected to it in one way or another, whether they like it or not. With, with you touching on that being a recovering, recovering addict, Chris, if I could ask a couple of things that just come to my mind is how much part of your recovery um, was uh, redemption, kind of um, seeking forgiveness from other people for what you'd been doing? Was, was that important? And I suppose the second question is, do, do you think some of your lyrics would have been as good had you not been through those difficulties? Um, well, it is about redemption. It's about forgiving yourself in many ways for uh, your state of mind and your being. Um, linked to trying to understand the depression that surrounds an alcoholic and an ad addict. It's quite a journey in itself. Um, I'm very grateful for for the recovery process because it's given me i guess a uh, a foundation to write more freely about self um and that may not be what everybody wants to hear but it's but it's good for me so i'm i have my own therapist chair which is in my head and i sit myself in the chair sometimes and write lyrics about how i feel yeah do you, do you feel that you um, made up with all those people that you that you may possibly tortured because of your your addiction, your problems, who were hurt by it? Do you feel you've um, you've you found some peace with those people, or or are there still people that you still need to find peace with? Oh, I think you can only find peace with people who are like minded, really, and people that understand recovery in the first place, because you're not tuning into the same wave wavelength it's you can go up to somebody and say i'm really sorry i did this that and the other and and i let you down and all that sort of thing but if they're not if they're not doing the work themselves mm. then they don't really understand the language so they may say thank you and respect the fact that you've you've apologized but and if they don't have the same knowledge then they can't understand where you're coming from yeah Chris, sorry, you've you've just got things going in my 
juices. And, and I was wondering whether you think there's a difference. Um, we, we run a, f- a food bank and, and breakfast club at church, and uh, we, we see uh, a lot of addicts who uh, probably can't afford to be addicts financially. It puts a huge burden on their lives. Do you think there's a difference between those kind of people who suffer addiction and people who uh, maybe fall into addiction from a place of um, being financially okay and, and can afford to can afford the habit, if that makes sense? Oh, I don't think anybody can afford the habit. I think everybody, whether you're wealthy or you're at a food bank, everybody who falls into the addictive behaviour falls because that's who they are. And they can only be saved by, by, by finding the rock bottom and by finding um, the spirituality that will save them from themselves. But not everybody wants that. You know, I'm constantly in touch with people who who are crying out to me saying, my son, you know, he's, I can't live with him. He's sneaking bottles of vodka into his bedroom. Um, He's up at four o'clock in the morning stealing money from us. You know, I get calls like this the whole time. And, And I say, well, you really can't do anything about it other than live with it until such time as that person is ready and willing to jump ship. Mm. If you're happy to answer this question, Chris, what was your rock bottom? What was, what was, what was the bottom of the ship that you at the bottom of the ocean that you had to hit before your life changed trajectory? Um, well, I was exhausted by touring and uh, being in a band. I, I, I sort of bottomed out on, um, just not, uh, not not wanting to do what I was doing. I was kind of suffocating myself by using the whole time. And um, nobody in the band or anybody around me was kind of recognizing that fact. And then I came back from an American tour and my best friend who was a drug dealer had got sober which really pissed me off. Um, but then when I realized what, how he changed and what he'd got, that's where my rock bottom came because I saw something in him that I dearly wanted to have, but couldn't have. And it took me a, a good year or so to, to reach, to find out where my knees were. Yeah. And then once I was on my knees, then the only way was to come back up. Gosh, that's that's quite that's quite moving, uh, but on that way back up, Chris, was was that a pleasurable experience? Was that um, something that you recognised that the recovery was coming, uh, and was or was that was it forever a struggle? Um, uh, there, there were elements of it that were a struggle. The addict's very clever person, you know, lives within and can topple your daily regime a whim really Uh, you've got to really keep it under control so um there have been times when it's not been plain sailing but um only i can screw it up and i um i I understand that so the complexities of being on the road in a band and the complexities of being in a relationship um are they, you know, that that takes a lot of work. Mm. Takes a lot of work. And do you and, and do you talked about some of those, some of those people that get in contact with you? What what's the best advice you offer, or you can offer? Well, this is a problem because everybody's comes with a different problem that I, as an ex, uh, outsider, can't resolve for anybody, but. There are support groups for families who have kids that are in depression and and alcoholics and addicts, which is called Al-Anon. And Al-Anon is the best place for for people to go if they need um, help understanding a family member and what is going on. You'll never be able to understand it as a parent. It's impossible. 
um, you'll be climbing the walls 24 hours a day. So you have to let it go and, and understand what your role really should be. Alan on is brilliant at that sort of thing. Or finding a good counsellor, counsel of course, who can understand the dynamic of that family and why it's got to the place that it has. Um, you know, I remember somebody coming to me once and saying they were going to jump off a bridge and that they wanted to end their life. And, and I said, OK, I'll see you tomorrow. They didn't jump off a bridge. No. You know, they didn't. You know, I saw them the next day and they were absolutely fine. Yeah. It's just sometimes people need to say things like that. They need to show you how hurt or what despair they're in. Yeah. Chris, I do want I do want to get onto cheerier subjects in a moment, but but uh, just in terms of your healing of your relationship with Glenn, was, was that was that um, was that something in hindsight was long overdue, or 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 did that rest restoration of the relationship feel about right when it actually happened? Well, you know, he's the longest sort of standing family member I've got in my life, other than my brother who's older than me. Um, so to know somebody for 48 years, but not know them is kind of part of the journey of life. Um, I've often wondered why we've never been closer. But I've, you know, I don't wonder that anymore, because that's really not what we're about. We've come together on this, in this life to write songs. Mm. And I've written those songs. Um, we've enjoyed writing them and we tour them and people enjoy listening to them. And that's really the purpose of our uh, relationship in many ways. I think we're very different. And you will, you will find that in most bands, that is true of every relationship. That doesn't matter who you are, you're never going to be the same, you know, unless you're sparks. Yeah. I mean, Sparks are the only band I know who seem to get on because they're brothers, you know. Um, but then you've got Oasis, you've got, you had the Beatles, you've got Led Zeppelin, The Who. I mean, I can list every band on the, on the planet who have dysfunctional relationships that work. Yeah, yeah. When you, when you were estranged from Glenn, did, did you think about him a lot? Did you wonder what he was doing or, you know? We, um, yeah, I thought, I, I think I probably at the beginning, probably every day. Uh, and then, and then I didn't. And uh, for a couple of years, I had no idea what was going on and, and really, really wasn't interested in a strange way, uh, because I was doing what I was doing. And I needed to have that break. And it turns out Glenn needed to have that break too. So it was good for us both to go off and do our individual solo work and to discover who who we are outside of squeeze i guess yeah yeah um th thanks for being so honest chris it's great uh, it's really it's really fascinating stuff uh, um one of the, one of the things i told a few of my friends that i was uh, going to be interviewing chris difford from squeeze and um i think i quickly learned that you are still very popular with a lot of people as a as a band is is that something that you um that sits comfortably with you i was wondering you know um you rem i was i was trying to find similarities between you and, and depeche mode uh, depeche mode have had a very successful career as you have um but without a huge number of hits so they've, they've had successes um and I, and I suppose that's fair to say with Squeeze. Would you would you agree? You've, you've had, obviously had, had some absolute bangers, for want of a better word. But um, do you do you enjoy that relationship with your fans? When I go and see Depeche Mode, it doesn't bother me whether they sing an album track or, or whether it's um, you know a top ten single. Is that the case for you? Yeah, I, I love our audiences. They're fantastic people. Um, you know. They're very dedicated and they love what we do and I love what they do. It's a it's um it's a partnership. 
it's a partnership yeah. made in heaven in many ways, you know, to have the Albert Hall filled with people that love your songs. I mean, what could be better? Those are the kind of things you dream of when you're at school. Mm. <clears throat> and then when they happen, it's like, wow, this is incredible. Um, there's a lot of love for Squeeze and, you know, it's interesting, people obviously love the hits, pulling muscles, call for cats up top the junction, that sort of thing. But then when we play an obscure song, I feel a little bit awkward because I think people are going to go to the bar and have a drink. But actually, I'm probably wrong. Um, but that's just me, because if I went to see somebody I love, let's say Elvis Costello, and he played an obscure song, I'd go to the bar. <laughs> um, maybe. I don't, I, don't, I don't know. So it's... Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's a fantastic relationship. And you t you touched earlier about uh, the Madness show you're doing, bringing the audience to, uh, uh, you know, keeping the squeeze audience um, evolving, as it were. I mean, I, I I was doing a litmus test with my kids because I was playing a few squeeze songs on YouTube yeah. and saying, you know this, you know this, and you'd be pleased to know that they knew, that, you know, uh, in fact, our house has been singing "Labelled with Love" uh, most of this week. Actually, not necessarily <laughs> to the correct lyrics, of course, but but um, certainly the melodies there. Um, Chris, I, I want to ask about your songwriting and whether you um, whether you like sometimes that your lyrics might be ambiguous. Um, do, do you do you like your listener to work it out for themselves sometimes, or? And maybe the song that you've written, whatever it intentionally meant for you, means equally as much to somebody else, but maybe something completely too different to, to how you intended it, if that makes sense. Well, you know, if I listen to uh, a song written by somebody else, I'm going to interpret it the way that I see it. Um, and I think that's what people do when they listen to squeeze songs, they interpret it in their own way. Yeah. Do you do you like getting feedback? I mean, you know, if somebody asks you to tell you tell them what the song's about, does that irritate you in any way, or do you do you prefer them? Uh, you know, uh, would you offer an explanation? Of course. I mean, I don't know what most of them are about anyway, but I'll try and make <laughs> something up. <laughs> and and in terms of in terms of music. Chris, you're, um, as you, you use your own wonderful terms, you're at the other end of the corridor. Um, do, you, do you still feel like you're learning from your craft, about your craft and, and, and music? Oh, God, yeah. I mean, I, uh, when the songwriter arrives to work with me, he um, surprises me with what he comes up with and it's not very often these days that he he arrives but i have a shed where i work and um just recently he came to work with me i'm talking in a kind of schizophrenic way but that's what it's like um and we've written some great lyrics so i'm very very pleased and um um you know that's you know the way i write lyrics is for me and if other people like them then it's a bonus yeah yeah Chris has been fabulous talking to you. Just a, a couple of things, just talking about uh, bands and, and writers. What struck me about the Tramlines Festival was there were some fantastic bands, really great bands who I'd never heard of and, and um, the kind of person that always enjoys seeking out new bands. But it did, I did wonder how these people's careers are going to progress because um, I was talking to um, Rick from Shed 7 about this, about the need to make music that sells. And, um, you know, my understanding is that, that while Spotify is a great vehicle for music, it's not a great vehicle for generating a huge amount of income for bands. So do, do, what's your kind of view on, on take on the musical industry at the moment? Do you think it's set up properly or, you know, in terms of young bands, how, how do they, you know, what would your advice be for them moving forward? I don't think it's ever been set up properly for the songwriter. Um, I think it's always been an industry that's been greedy and um, really looks after its its own investors, if you like. Um, during lockdown, I've been working with a lot of writers that have been struggling through a charity called Help Musicians. And 
um, everybody says the same thing that you've just been talking about, you know, what is the future for us? You know, how do we make a crust? Um, and I think it's really hard. It's probably the toughest time to be an artist. You've got to be extremely lucky, much luckier than in the past. It's not about your talents, particularly as a human being or as, an, as a writer. It's about so many things that need to fall into place. Mm. Um, so, you know, I feel for um, people out there that are they've got bands and trying to make a name for themselves. It's, it's tough. Yeah. Yeah. And just finally, Chris, you, you've got, you've got the, the stuff with, with madness. Is, is there any new squeeze material in the pipeline? Is that something you, you've got an eye on or not? No, um, we've not had a conversation about writing anything new. I don't, foresee that happening for a good couple of years. I wonder what a squeeze album would would mean and what it would take to evolve into a new songwriting uh, pattern with the band. Um, you know, I, uh, I think we both work at, at different rhythms and have different time um, times to do things. I'm I, I like to sort of work quite quickly and uh, go with the spirit of the moment because I believe that that's the most important thing. You can't beat the spirit of the moment. Um, but not everybody I work with works like that. Some people take hours and days and months to to hone the craft that they that they that they have become part of. So I don't mind. Mis I like making mistakes. I think it's fun. And I think it's part of who I am. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Chris, thanks so much for your time. I, re I really appreciate it. So, so when, when do you get back to the UK? How, how, how long have you got left in America? Oh, uh, we don't get back till October. So it's a long time. Yeah. Busy time. Okay. Well, thanks so much. Uh, thanks. This is, you've been listening to myself with Chris Difford on the Godcast. If you like your music, there's, there's numerous artists on, on the site. So just go to, uh, www.thegodcast.co.uk but for now Chris uh, enjoy the rest of the tour and thanks for coming on The Godcast God bless. Toodle pip <coughs>